Okay, so the good news is um, the introduction was already given by um, Hilde. So we had the same task for the talk at the moment is, um, if I play the video again, um, it's like we do this kind of the segmentation of um, the video. So September segmentation task, we get a video and we have a correct prediction if the ground cross labeling of each of the frame correspond to our predictions. Uh, we had already seen different kind of approaches how to model like temporal relations. Um, recurrent neural networks was proposed. There's also like memory based approaches. And uh, the third type of approaches are the so called temporal convolution neural networks. And there was like the work by Leah et al. where they also had kind of a, even a compression. I think uh, Raul mentioned this like compression is some kind of information where you compress the temporal information. But this network had some kind of shortcoming in terms of the temporal resolution. And if you talk about fine grained classification, it's the same like image classification. The higher resolution you have, the better the results will be because you're not, you cannot throw up away too much information. So this was actually inspiration from, for us, this kind of the network architecture. And at the end, what we use is like was inspired also by the WaveNet architecture, what is actually well known from the audio processing part, where we had kind of a, a network with temporal related convolutions and then we have different kind of layers and then we make the prediction of the action labels. It turned however out if we just take this kind of the network from audio processing or speech processing this doesn't work on video data. Actually the accuracy at the beginning was quite low. So what actually helped was like we not having like a single network but we use what people also do in the context of human pose estimation. So we stack the network block. So we at the end we increase the receptive fields but we have the intermediate loss at different kind of levels. You can all think of kind of we have a hierarchy of the temporal relation. So the more we go in our receptive fields we still have some intermediate loss. And this actually was essential because only this gives us very good uh, results compared to just like adding more layers after each other. But we still had a certain problem because the way how you train it, you take the standard cross entropy where you minimize the loss for each of the frames. But at the end, what you see, the results, what you get, this is like a temporal segmentation of the ground truth of a video sequence. And this is the prediction what our model gives us. So we're already having multiple stages, but you see here, we have some over segmentation. So we have the gray action and we have this kind of red action in between. And this is like the problem having kind of sequence to sequence model, this kind of over segmentation occur very often. So it's like it seems that it doesn't necessarily figures out directly the right granularity to predict. So what we however observed is like when this over segmentation happens, this is the case when we have two class probabilities which are very similar because there's at the time in the entire action segment, the gray and the red, the probabilities are very similar. So we added like an additional loss which actually penalizes it. So at the end, if I have small variation between two frames of my class probabilities, I penalize it. So I want to smooth it out. But if you have a big jump that you also know from graph cut, for instance, then we don't penalize it because then we really have a change of the activities. And the point is like here, we add this additional loss term to the training because we didn't want to do any post-processing. And this actually solved most, not everything of the over segmentation, but most of the over segmentation problem. So we see here, this gray segment, the red segment actually disappeared. So this is some results. So you see it also like um, if you look, compare just the color coding of the ground cross and the prediction, the results at least on the data set what we used visual, they are nearly like perfect. There's still kind of a small change on the starting and the ending and a few issues with over segmentation. But if you train with enough training data, we get actually perceptual extreme high accurate results. But this is so far just like what I mentioned at the beginning. I not only want to talk how we analyze the past, I also want to talk about how to predict the future because we also collaborate with people from robotics and if you just analyze what happened, it's too late. So the robots actually, they have to plan and if they don't want to bump into a person and they have to be at the right time in the right location. And the same is also autonomous driving. It's not enough to make the decision after you've observed it. You have to predict in the future what is actually coming. And this is actually what I want to actually talk is like just analyzing the data as we have is for some applications simple not enough because we have to anticipate um, the future. So most work for anticipation has been done on human most post forecasting. So we see given as an input a sequence of skeleton motion and now the task is like you see it when the color changes you continue the forecast the time series so we have just like this red and this green was your input and now this yellow and bright green this is actually what you forecast 
And the thing, there are different kind of approaches. Most of the networks are actually quite simple. However, what it turns a little bit out is like the way how this approaches are evaluated. And this actually is using the completely wrong measure. The standard way is like the following situation. Let's go just, I want to walk. I'm the person here and now I'm getting to a building. Should I go to the left and to the right? I only have the option. Let's say because of the train data, it's 50% going to the left and 50% going to the right. Obviously, the, if I look at the L2 error and I minimize it, the best result going straight forward because at the end, it's 50-50%, the L2 error is minimized just going through the building, which gives you a very low L2 error, but the prediction doesn't make sense because I cannot walk through walls, at least not in our case. So this is a little bit kind of the problem, partly for forecasting, which is different to what we analyze the observed data. We have to be very careful. We cannot simply take the measurement what we take from analyzing video data for the forecasting task. And that is like the problem with the L2 error. The good news is if I want to train a model, um, we already know how to do it if you don't want to have the L2 error. And this actually has done um, by many approaches, which means you have a generative model which generates from the prediction what is like a future sequence of human motion, and you have a standard discriminator which actually classify if the generated motion was realistic or it was unrealistic. So coming back to our example, if we predict just the mean prediction, then it would be easy task for the discriminator to tell us, well, this is unrealistic because I know either in my training data the person went to the left and went to the right. So this is one of the good thing is like if I want to train it and I want to get rid of my L2 error, I can use a standard GAN model. This has been used in many works. But it also means how do we do the evaluation? The standard method is still taking the L2 error because it's easy to compute but it's totally wrong. It doesn't make sense for forecasting because it assumes a unimodal distribution of the future. Well, one way what we can do, one can do user studies. We also have done it. So we show um, two videos and then the humans are the discriminator. have to figure out which one is the realistic motion and which one is generated. But user studies have the problem that technically it's hard to repeat, um, reproduce the results. Every time when you have a new method, you would need to run a new user study. There is also some good news, however, there's also some other measurements. Even they are not that um, so popular in the computer vision community at the moment, but I can also look at the frequency distribution. So for instance, there's methods on normalized power spectrum similarity. And this actually is also not a perfect measure, but at least is much better than the L2 norm because you look at it if the frequency is the same. It actually turns out if you take the L2 error and you predict zero velocity, it's just like keeping the motion, then you get a very low L2 error, which is highly unrealistic. But you're looking at the frequency domain, then you get a much better description. <laughs> so we cannot only do it for human motion, we can also do it for activity. So instead, before we get our video data, and now we not want to analyze the video data, but we want to predict what activity will happen in the future. Since the, the time is relatively short, I'm not showing the, the perfect working examples, but actually the failure cases. And what you see here at the bottom, again, the ground crew. So far we have the observation. And then on top, this is like what we predict. So it's a moment, it's like buttering the pan. And now we start the prediction. Everything from here, you see the future prediction in the range. So now we predict what activity is happening in the future. And so far as prediction is fine. So adding salt and pepper is in the ground truth and actually predicted. Now we have a mistake. And if I stop it here, the mistake what we're observing is in the actual sequence, what is happening, the person fries the egg, but our model predicts it still fries the egg. But this is not really a mistake because this person is not part of the training data. So we don't have a personalized model, so we don't know the, the preference of the person. The only what he has observed, there was some X at the beginning, there were a pan, and we cannot distinguish these two cases. And now we make like a test how hard actually this um, task is. So I will show you a video and then also in the, ta in, the, in the talk in the morning, the first one, I will ask you what will happen in the future. Let's first see what's happening. So the person enters the scene, uh, he takes a mug. So this is like the annotation also of the data set. This gray means just like background, no activity and takes a cup. And now we'll ask you what will happen next. To make the things a little bit easier for you, I give you three options. The first option, the person makes coffee, pours coffee and pours milk. 
The second option is he adds a tea bag and pours water. And the third option is spoon powder. So like making chocolate is also part of the action classes. So if you like take chocolate powder into a cup, it's also an activity in this data set. So I will now show you the video again. And then we will raise the hands for the option A, B, C. And then we'll have to look what um, you think will happen. So this is the video. He takes the mug. And now we have the three options. So please raise your hand if you think it's like poor coffee will happen next. Is he a computer scientist? Yeah, <laughs> majority. Who prefers to add tea pack and pour water, so making tea? Still, some also vote for it. Who is for spoon powder? Also someone. So I would simply say it's like the half making coffee, 25% tea and 25% making hot chocolate. Let's look at the video. So we continue from when we stopped the last time. <laughs> it's the tea, it's actually happening here. But technically, it's like the good news is like in the matter is good, every one of you was correct. Because it's in based on the information, we could not really judge for it. We have maybe some prior for coffee, which probably I would also have. But in this case, the person actually prefers to make the tea pack. And this is actually like preparing tea. But this actually shows that what I mentioned before is like that the future, so this is actually it's not a unique deterministic. Sometimes on the information, we cannot judge at this point what will happen in the future. And therefore, at the end, we also saw it's like not generating a single future path, but multiple one. So you see at the top row, this is our observation from the video sequence. This is actually what is happening in the video as it was labeled. And this is actually the different kind of future path, but actually our model actually predicts. And the way how we do it is like actually a minor modification of the model what we had before. So what we do is actually like we first we actually analyze the past, so what happened before, which gives us like segments of actions. We encode them in a compact form, so it's like a matrix form where each um, column here corresponds to a single action segment. We feed it into a recurrent neural network and this actually predicts for what is the probability of the next action class. But now we now take the argmax, but we sample sample from this distribution. So what we have here so far is like we have a probability of class probabilities, even if it's like 90% coffee, 10% tea, we still have the chance that the one forward pass actually will sample the class T as the next step. And then to get the length of the segment, we condition the network on the sampled class, and then again we pro pro predict the probability of the length and we sample from it. Which means that in each forward pass to the sample, we get different paths for future activities happening in the future. And this is some of the things what actually here are generated by this kind of the network, um, which you see is like all this kind of the answer what I've mentioned before actually are predicted. And we have also seen that every one of you, even the my majority was for coffee, there was still some for the options B and C. So here's the tea bag, um, here's this kind of the spoon powder, and we also have this um, poor coffee classes in the data set. So you see also the variation of the length. So usually we always continue with the last observed activity because at the end here the length what we predict can however also be zero. But you see also the variation of the length what we get and also the variation of the activities which come actually at the next stage. So this brings me already to um, the end. So one of the things which has not really brought up um, because at the end also the way how we do the evaluation is still an open problem. So for the forecasting, I just give the example of the L2 norm, which is like a, a standard measurement, which actually does not make sense at all for the task, but it's actually the standard measurement as it used. But still for temporary action segmentation, it's still not really clear what is the best measurement. I mean, for classification it's clear, but how accurate actually does this motion boundaries actually need to be selected. So just the how to do the right evaluation metrics is still kind of an open problem. The other thing is also a little bit kind of um, the, the data set. This was already mentioned a little bit before. On the one hand, we need very large data set because only on large data set we can investigate certain questions like scalability or how much we can learn and then reuse the information. But there's also some implication and you have to be a little bit careful. If you only focus on this large data set, um, there will be no interns for the companies anymore because at the end the PhD student will think twice do you apply for a topic where I compete with a company or if I maybe do a PhD in robotics. So this is really a problem. Um, the other thing is adverse conditions. 
So this is a little bit different. We have large data sets, but for instance, like pedestrian detection, we have this kind of schedule where we can look, okay, this is like small persons, difficult cases. And this little bit side effect, adverse conditions usually are, um, do not occur too frequently, which means like to get high numbers on the benchmark, by intention, either by learning implicitly or explicitly, you get a better result if you actually ignore the difficult case. Just solve the easy 90%, ignore the rest. Even for application, this rest 20%, this might be relevant if you think, for instance, autonomous driving. And now I want to come to my last open problem. <laughs> I'm not sure what happened, but I looked for Wikipedia, it was the first entry of the image for the head in the morning. And, and I don't want to know what is the differential, how we can differentiate the brain, but the thing is like this is a little bit beyond the community. So it's a moment we have a strong focus to make everything of the model, how we can make it differentiable to have end-to-end -end learning. It's a valid point to really see what is the limit what we can get with differential functions, but it's still kind of the open problem, maybe we miss something. Maybe there is some component which we cannot handle by differential function. At least we get rid of this convex assumption that everything has to be convex. Now we are still in the differential case. So this is just like my few points and we have now time for questions.